This video is for my 7th grade math class and it's over lesson 32, metric system. Now before we get into the metric system, uh, the system that we primarily use here in the United States is called the customary system or U.S. customary system. Um, and the U.S. customary system, uh, if I'm fair, uh, well, well I, I personally like it just because I find the numbers interesting. Um, if I'm fair, it, it's old and it's awkward. Um, most of the world has abandoned the customary system. In fact, when I was growing up and I first learned about the, the customary system, it was called the English customary system. But the English have abandoned it. And, and so now it's called the U.S. customary system since we are one of the, the last countries in the world to continue to use it. Um, and so it, it's, it's awkward because you can end up using all kinds of different numbers in your, your conversions. Like um, you might say, uh, that two tablespoons is an ounce, uh, or or three teaspoons is a tablespoon. Um, you might say four quarts is one gallon. Uh, you might say uh, eight ounces is one cup. Twelve inches is one foot. Um, Twelve ounces is one pound. Five thousand two hundred and eighty feet is one mile. Uh, and so we have all these changing numbers when it comes to our conversions. So on the other hand, the metric system was developed to make our conversions much simpler. And so they're all based on powers of 10. Powers of 10 like 10, 100, 1000. And so most of our conversions then are just going to be a matter of shifting decimal places. Because when you multiply or divide by a power of 10, you move your decimal place. Uh, and it was also designed to have very uh, easy conversions between our different kinds of measures, which we'll talk about towards the end of the lesson here. So some advantages of the metric system is that it is a decimal system. And this is just a way of saying that it's based on 10. So all of our conversions are going to have to do with 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and so on. The other advantage is that the kinds of units are linked to each other, purposely linked to each other. So it's a decimal system and the kinds of units are linked to each other. Now before we actually get into the different measurements in the metric system, uh, the metric system is full of a bunch of prefixes. And down here in this chart, I have a number of them. I don't have all of them. Um, there are more than just these. Um, but this is going to be our, our set that we're going to stick with, uh, at least for right now. And so our first prefix here is kilo. So kilo means that um, you have, well, you know, I'm going to change my name. I'm sorry about that. Uh, let's go to the base unit. Okay, uh, so in each of our, our categories, we're going to have a base unit. Um, so, uh, for example, length. The base unit of length is a meter. So in the metric system, and I'll try to get that out of the glare there for you. Meter, there you go. Uh, so meter, um, everything else is going to be some adjustment on a meter. So some prefix, then meter, and you can probably think of several right now off the top of your head. Uh, if we're talking about capacity, the base unit will be a liter. And then finally, if we're talking about mass, the base unit is a gram. So now let's go back and let's look at these prefixes. So these prefixes are going to modify each one of these base units. So if I put deca in front of it, deca meter, deca liter, deca gram, deca means that you have 10 of whatever that base unit is. And its abbreviation is actually, it's get, it gets a double letter. It's one of the, the only ones I can think of off the top of my head that gets a double letter. So dk for deca. And so if we have a deca meter, that means you have 10 of that base unit, 10 meters. Uh, hecto is the next one up. Remember, this is all based on tens, hundreds, thousands. So hecto must mean you have a hundred of your base unit. And its abbreviation is an H. 
So a hectoliter would mean that you have 100 liters. And then finally, coming back up here to the kilogram, finally, kilogram is a thousand of that base unit, and its prefix is a K. So a kilogram is telling you that you have a thousand grams. Now, coming down here into the blue, okay, we're going the other direction. So instead of getting a bunch of these, 10, 100, 1,000, we're now going to be cutting them up into smaller pieces. So instead of the prefix deca, if we make that a soft K sound, uh, the soft uh, C sound, excuse me, uh, desa, desa, uh, we have one-tenth of the base unit. And that is just a single D. And so that's probably the most confusing there. We've got deca and desa. They found something very similar. Uh, the, the hard sound means you got 10 of them and it gets the double letter. The soft C sound there means you've got only a tenth. So that means if you had a decimeter, means take a meter, cut it up into 10 equal pieces, and you've got just one of those. Uh, moving down, this should be pretty uh, familiar, especially if we combine it with meter again. Centa uh, means one hundredth. It means one hundredth. And so its abbreviation, of course, is C, and we're most familiar that, with that with a centimeter. So a centimeter is one hundredth of a meter. And then finally, milla. Milla is our abbreviation for one thousandth. One thousandth. And its abbreviation is a lowercase m. Now remember that this is a decimal system, so typically we're not going to write these as, as fractions. Uh, normally, if we're going to write these out, we're normally going to write these as decimals. So if we're talking about a tenth of the base unit, we're talking about 0.1 of that base unit. Um, if we're talking about a hundredth, we're talking about 0.01 of that base unit. And then likewise a thousandth, 0.001 of that base unit. And just a quick reminder, remember that if there's one zero in the denominator, then there's one decimal place in your decimal. So there are four basic categories of measurements that we're going to talk about. Um, so just as we've done in the chart above, we're going to continue talking about length or distance. Uh, we're going to continue talking about capacity, which is the amount of space something occupies. We're going to talk about mass, which is the amount of matter something is made up of. And then finally, we're going to talk about temperature. So temperature is a little different from the others. So let's go ahead and flip the page. And we're going to start off with length. And so you'll see that we've got a, a very similar chart to the front. Uh, we're going to apply this now specifically to length. So the base unit for length is a meter. Base unit for length is a meter. And don't worry about the connection right now, we'll fill that in later. So um, that means that the units we have here for length are kilometer, that kilo changes to kilom. Um, so instead of kilometer, kilometer. Uh, then we've got a hectometer, we got a decameter, and then just the plain old base unit meter. We have a decimeter, a centimeter, and then a millimeter. Those are all different length measurements in the metric system. And so meter is abbreviated as a single lowercase m. So kilometer, kilo is k, meter is m. So kilometer km. Um, so hectometer. HM, decameter, remember that's the DK, so DKM is decameter, uh, meter is just a plain old M, decimeter is the DM, centimeter, and millimeter. And so if we apply uh, the um, definitions of our prefixes, like we said on the front, one decameter should be 10 meters. One hectometer should be 100 meters, and one kilometer should be 1,000 
meters. Get that out of the shadow there a little bit. Okay. Uh, if we continue down into the, the blue section, so one decimeter is one tenth of a meter, one tenth of a meter or 0 0.1 meters. One centimeter is cents is a hundredth, so 0 0.01, two decimal places, since 100 has two zeros, of a meter. And then one millimeter, the double M, so milli is a thousandth, so we got three decimal places there. Now, while these are true, um, they're not terribly helpful. We, we prefer to be working with whole numbers. So if we just think about multiplying these both by 10, then we're going to end up with one meter equals 10 decimeters. We're going to multiply these by 100 each, and so one meter will equal 100 centimeters. And there's the conversion that we're used to thinking. So for the little guys, it, we kind of end up turning them around on themselves, and instead of thinking fractions or decimals, um, whereas you know a decameter is 10 meters, we think of it taking 10 decimeters to make a meter. Um, so for the little guys, it's more about how many it takes to make that bigger thing. Um, and so to finish that off, then one meter would be a thousand millimeters. Now in the end, ladies and gentlemen, the ones that I already have highlighted in yellow for you are the ones that you should memorize. So there are a lot of extra conversions that are true in the metric system that don't come up very often. Uh, hectometer, well, hectometer is a real measurement. It's not one that's talked about very often. So it's not one that I would say you generally need to really worry about knowing. Um, likewise with a decameter or even a decimeter. So they, they exist, but they're not used terribly often. Um, so when it comes to uh, the metric system, uh, we in the United States do primarily use the uh, customary system though. Uh, so it's good also to, to have access to the conversions between the two systems. So one kilometer is approximately 0 0.6 miles. And then one mile we could say is 1.6 kilometers. Those are both acceptable conversions there. So you can see that a mile is longer than a kilometer. And then one meter is approximately 1.1 yards. So if you ever see a yardstick and a meter stick close to each other, right next to each other, um, the meter is just a little bit longer, but they're actually pretty close. And then finally, one inch is approximately 2.54 centimeters. So we're going to move on to our next category, uh, and our next category is uh, capacity. So capacity, the base unit for capacity is a liter, as we talked about on the front. And don't worry about the con connection. We're going we're gonna to fill that in in a second. I haven't forgotten about the one up top and the length. Uh, it's coming. So if liter is our base unit here, let's go ahead and fill that in here. So liter, L-I-T-E-R. Uh, then we have all these prefixes to modify that. So we have a kiloliter. We have a hectoliter, we have a decaliter, we have a deciliter, we have a centiliter, and we have a milliliter. The prefix for liter uh, is kind of unusual. The prefix for liter specifically is a capital L. It's a, not a lowercase l, it's a capital L. So kiloliter is a lowercase k but a capital L. Hectoliter is a lowercase h, but a capital L. Decaliter, DK, remember. DK, capital L, though. Deciliter is DL, capital L. Decentiliter, CL, capital L. And milliliter is lowercase m, capital L. Uh, really, out of these two, uh, or out of these, there's really only two that we typically use um, in our culture, uh, and that's the liter and the milliliter. So you really don't hear about the others being talked about. They're true, they're real, they are actual things. We just don't hear about them as often. Okay. And so applying the meaning then of these, 
real quick here. Um, so deca means 10. So one decaliter is 10 liters. Um, one hectoliter, hecto means 100. So one hectoliter is 100 liters. And then one kiloliter, kilo means 1,000. So one kiloliter is 1,000 liters. Uh, if we flip it around, then go to the little guys. One deciliter is 0 0.1 liters. Or if we kind of switch that around, then it means that one liter is going to be 10 deciliters. It's going to take 10 of those little guys to make the one liter. And then one centiliter is 0 0.01 liters, or one liter is 100 centiliters. And then finally, one milliliter is 1.001 liters, in other words, one thousandth of a liter. Okay, which means finishing that off, one liter is 1,000 milliliters. And so you'll notice here I've already got it highlighted what you need to memorize. Well, remember there's really only two units that we use in this category. Uh, and so because there's only two that we use in the category, there's really only one conversion that you need to know, and that's to convert between those two that we use. Um, so this is really the only conversion that we need to have memorized, is that one liter equals a thousand milliliters. Now at this point, we're actually going to go and travel back up here to length, to that connection. So the connection between length and capacity is that if we take one centimeter, we make a cube out of it. So one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter cube. This cube will have a one milliliter capacity. So one cubic centimeter is one milliliter. And again, there's that nice connection. It's a nice one-to-one. -one. So if I told you you had 83 cubic centimeters, you know instantly that conversion means you've got 83 milliliters. So that conversion becomes really easy then, as long as you're moving from this guy to that guy. Um, if you're moving from something else, like cubic decimeters, all right, it's going to be a little more complicated, but, but just a matter of moving decimals. And how many times do you move that decimal? So coming down here again, uh, talking about uh, metric to customary system, uh, one liter is approximately 1.05 quarts. So you can see a liter is a little bit more than a quart, but they're pretty close. A liter and a quart are really pretty close. So when we're talking about a gallon, a gallon is four quarts. It's about four liters. Uh, four liters would actually be more than a gallon, but they're pretty close. Okay. So we're going to move on to our next section now, mass. Uh, and before we get into mass, there's one important thing that, it, you know, speaking between metric system and customary system, um, it's, it's good to have clear in our minds, is that um, the metric system and the customary tr system uh, treat this kind of general concept differently. Um, so mass actually refers to the, the measure of the amount of, Sorry, I kind of messed that M up there. I'm going to fix my writing. There we go. The amount of matter that something is made up of. So it's literally how much matter is this made up of. So remember, matter, matter is just the stuff um, that makes things up. So how much stuff is making this up? Um, so mass, the, the important thing about mass then, especially if you think about, let's say, space, um, as you head out into space, mass doesn't change. When you move from planet to planet, or when you move from being on, let's say, the Earth to being in outer space, um, mass doesn't change. The amount of stuff that something's made up of isn't going to change just because you go to a different planet. It's not going to change uh, just because you go to outer space. On the other hand, weight measures the effect of gravity. on an object or a person. So the effect of gravity. So that will change. If I go to a planet with more gravity than Earth, then I'm going to weigh more. If I go, let's say, to the moon, which has less gravity than Earth, I'm going to weigh less. Now my size isn't going to change. My mass, the amount of stuff I'm made up of, isn't going to change. But I'm not going to have gravity pulling on me the same way as I do here on Earth. If I go out into outer space, 
uh, where where basically gravity goes down to to essentially zero, um, we say that we're weightless. Uh, does that mean that we basically become so tiny we disappear? Well, no, of course not. Our size doesn't change. Our mass doesn't change, but just the amount of gravity pulling on us. Okay. So if you think about, you know, your, your muscles can lift a certain amount of weight. That means if you go into outer space, you know, your foot weighs a certain amount. So in space, it's going to be even easier to move your, your foot because it weighs less. If you're on, on the moon, um, again, less gravity, so less weight. Uh, again, it's going to be easier to move your foot than it would be here on Earth. Whereas if you were to travel to a planet that has higher gravity than Earth, so like if Jupiter had a uh, solid surface that we could land on, um, Jupiter has a lot more gravity than we do. And so it would be harder to lift your foot. Not that anything had changed about your foot. There's just more gravity weighing it down. Okay. So with that being said, the metric system measures mass. Whereas in the customary system, we measure weight. So when we talk about pounds and ounces and things like that and tons, uh, we are actually talking about um, we're actually talking about um, we're talking about weight. Uh, whereas when we're talking about the metric system, the base unit is a gram. When we're talking about grams, we're talking about how much matter it's made up of. So we're going to come here to our chart, middle here, gram. And so we're going to fill our chart in again. So we've got a kilogram. We've got a hectogram. We've got a decagram. We're going to have a decigram, centigram, and a milligram. And you can see on this chart, oops, I added an extra E in there. Sorry about that. Uh, you can see in this chart we're going to add in actually one more uh, prefix uh, that doesn't get used with the other ones because this one actually does come up to some degree. Uh, and this one actually is a megagram. A megagram. And we'll talk about what mega means in just a second. So first let's start with what we know. So gram gets the prefix G. So we got a kilogram, a hectogram, a decagram a decigram, a centigram, a milligram, and then now a megagram. And you'll notice that the prefix for mega is a capital M. So this is again one of those weird times where something gets a capital letter on purpose. So if it's a lowercase, we're talking milla, we're talking uppercase mega, and you're going to see in a second here, it makes a big difference. So we've got to pay attention to that. All right, so up top here, Going back to our prefixes, we'll, let's just work our way down this chart. So a kilogram, kilo means a thousand, so that's a thousand grams. And that's one that you have to have memorized. A hectogram, hecto means a hundred, so hectogram is one hundred grams. A decagram is one is ten grams. And so a decigram, deca is a tenth, so zero point one grams. Or if we flip that around, one gram then is ten decigrams. A centigram is one hundredth of a gram, so 0 0.01 grams. Or if we flip that around, one gram is 100 centigrams. One milligram is 0 .10, 0 0.001 grams, or one thousandth of a gram. And we flip that around, we get the other conversion here that we have to memorize. That one gram is 1,000 milligrams. So two conversions that we need to have memorized here. And at this point, I, I'm, I'm going to hold off on that for just a second because we have what we need now to flip back to the other page to capacity and make our next connection. So the metric system was designed that one milliliter of water. So water is a very important substance in science, uh, and the metric system really lends itself to science. So specifically, it's, it's built around water. So one milliliter of water equals one gram of water. And so again, we have that nice one-to-one -one connection. So if I know, if I have 83 milligrams of water, or excuse me, 83 milliliters of water, I know that's 
83 grams of water. All right. And so while we're um, while we're talking this out, we're going to come up here and make our final connection as well. So as we just said in the last one, one gram of water then, and we're going to cycle back to that distance section, uh, connect it back up there then. This would be then one cubic centimeter of water, since one milliliter is the same as one centimeter, cubic centimeter, then one gram of water is equal to one cubic centimeter of water. All right, so with that being said, we're going to come back down now to this megagram. So one megagram, one megagram equals one metric ton. And we can't just call it a ton because a ton is part of the customary system. So if you say a ton, we're talking about 2,000 pounds. So if you want to talk about one megagram, uh, that's one metric ton. Now, that sounds like a lot. Well, yes, because it is. Um, so um, one megagram, mega means a thousand thousand. So one megagram is actually 1,000 kilograms. One megagram is 1,000 kilograms. And, uh, well, if we think about it another way, 1,000 thousand, though, is really a million. So mega actually means million. So a megagram is a million grams. And this last one really is just more for your information. We don't really have to worry about that when it comes to the book. So conversions to the customary system. One kilogram is 2.2 .2 pounds. So kilograms more than double a pound. So if you ever hear about people talking about um, uh, weights, uh, but in the um, in the metric system, um, their weight will be uh, you know less than half of what it would be in um, in the customary system because they're not actually measuring uh, the weight; they're actually measuring the mass and a kilogram is a lot more. Uh, now this is under the assumption that we're here on Earth. So the gravity on the surface of the Earth is roughly the same pretty much wherever you go. Um, so that's why we can make this conversion. Now if we were to go to the moon, this is going to change. One kilogram is going to be a lot less, um, lots less poundage. Um, whereas you go to some place that's got more gravity than, than Earth, then one kilogram um, would be a lot more pounds. So it just depends on where you are, but we do assume the surface of the earth generally, because that's usually where we're found. All right, and then finishing it off, one metric ton then is equal to 1.1 tons, and that would be the customary tons. So it's a little over a, a customary ton. So next up we have this little chart here, um, and this just is a visual to show us the connections um, between the kinds of measurements. Um, and so we've got um, one gram, one cubic centimeter, one milliliter, and it's always a one to one to one with these. Um, and I've color coordinated it here, so one cubic centimeter always is one milliliter. It doesn't matter what substance you're working with, that's always true. Um, however, this connection to one gram here is for water, H2O is water, specifically. So if you move to a different substance, there are other substances that may have more density or less density than water, which means that this connection may no longer hold. So if you're, if you're talking about, let, let, you know, um, eggnog, you know, uh, that's going to have um, more density than, than water. Um, so this isn't going to hold these blue sections for something other than water necessarily. All right, which brings us to our last category. Our last category here is temperature. And so when it comes to temperature, there are two temperature scales for the metric system. Uh, the most common one that we see out in society is called Celsius. So C-E-L-C-I-U-S. And we usually abbreviate that as degrees Celsius. 
so the degree symbol, and then a normal capital C. Um, so when it comes to temperatures, uh, I every once in a while I see students that will take this capital letter and try to make it small. Uh, no, it, it's a full size normal capital C. And then the other system, the other scale that we use is called Kelvin. And now Kelvin is abbreviated as just a capital K. No degree symbol, just a capital K. So both of these temperature scales are what are called centigrade scales. Centigrade scales. And they're called centigrade scales because centa means 100. And they're called centigrade scales because there are 100 degrees between water freezing and boiling. 100 degrees between water freezing and boiling. So again, we base a lot of these, these things off of water. So uh, we're going to look here now. Um, some conversions. Um, so um, at this point I, I would recommend um, that uh, you pause the video and just see uh, how many of the conversions that you already know. Uh, maybe just write them in lightly and that way if you're wrong you can erase them and fix them. Uh, but just give it a shot and see how many of them you, auto you automatically know. All right we're gonna uh, I'm, a, I'm hoping that you paused uh, and so we're gonna keep moving now. Uh, so probably one of the most um, recognizable ones would be to change um, from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Um, so because we're changing to Fahrenheit, it's going to start with F equals. So F equals 9 fifths C plus 32. Now there's nothing to figure out here. That's just something to memorize. Um, but that's one that I would definitely um, tell you to memorize. So let's highlight that with our yellow. Now from here, uh, let's say we want to change from, um, from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Then basically we want to turn this around. Uh, and so we would subtract 32, and then we'd multiply by the reciprocal of 9 fifths. Um, and so we end up with this formula. Oops, I did a double five there. Sorry about that. Uh, we end up with this formula here. Which is not a very common formula to use, but it, it is there. So if you do need to change something from Fahrenheit to Celsius, there's your formula. Uh, the next formula that we're going to tackle is changing uh, from Celsius to Kelvin uh, because it's actually really simple. Um, so if you've got Celsius and you want to change it to Kelvin, uh, real simple, you're just going to add 273. That's it. So if you want to change Celsius to Kelvin, Kelvin, just add 273 to your Celsius and that's what your Kelvin is. So if something is 5 degrees Celsius, it's 278 degrees Kelvin when we add the 5 there to that 273. So now uh, probably the next easiest formula to fill in at this point would be what if I want to change from uh, Kelvin to Celsius? Well, if you want to change from Kelvin, just subtract that 273. And so with that being understood, um, then our, our last two parts here are really just a matter of, of plugging in the information we already know. So if I want to change from Kelvin to Fahrenheit, well we already know Fahrenheit 9 fifths C plus 32. So I'm going to take that 9 fifths and then I know that um, I know that Celsius is Kelvin minus 273. So I'm just going to replace that C, that C, with what it's equal to. Oops, 73. And then we still have the plus 32 at the end there. So it makes for kind of an awkward formula. Um, honestly, if, if I were to do this, I would probably just take my, my Kelvin, convert it to Celsius, 
and then take the Celsius and convert it to Fahrenheit. I probably do this in two steps instead of trying to use that formula, but it exists. That is the formula. Uh, and so if we come up here, if we want to change from Fahrenheit to uh, to Kelvin, uh, well, we know that Celsius plus 273 is Kelvin. And we know that Celsius is 5 ninths times the quantity F minus 32. So instead of Celsius, I'm going to do that 5 ninths times F minus 32. And then we'll still have to add the 273. And so really out of these, there's only one formula that you need to memorize, and that's right there. Um, all the rest of them, if you need them, look them up when you need them. Um, but I wouldn't say you've got to memorize them. Okay. Which brings us to the last part of the video here. And again, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and pause the video and fill in uh, whatever you think you can remember. And then you can hit play again and, and check how you did. All right, so let's go ahead and do this then. So we're starting with the freezing point of zero. So in Fahrenheit, this is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. For Celsius, remember Celsius is designed around water. Um, a lot of that science stuff, that metric system is designed around water. So zero degrees Celsius, <coughs> excuse me, is the freezing point for Celsius. So now if we want to change that to Kelvin, just add 273. So 273 plus zero is, well, 273. So 273 Kelvin is when water freezes. So despite the very large number there, it's actually fairly cold. Move on to the boiling point of water. So in Fahrenheit, that's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So you notice those both ends with twos. Um, they're 180 degrees away from each other. But remember that Celsius is a centigrade scale. So Celsius, the, the boiling point of water, is 100 degrees away. Calvin is also a centigrade scale. So it's also 100 degrees away from freezing to boiling. Now, room temperature is kind of a funny thing because, you know, each room can be a different temperature. But generally speaking, room temperature is considered to be 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which then is 20 degrees Celsius. And then if I add my 273, 293 Kelvin. Uh, average body temperature is something that is uh, kind of changing. Um, I believe now it's officially... Uh, 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, however, for our mathematical purposes, for the purposes of, of doing the homework in the book, um, the book and the homework are going to consider uh, the old average body temperature, which was 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what used to be considered average. And so that comes out with a nice 37 degrees Celsius which then if we add our 273, that's 310 degrees Kelvin. So, uh, which brings us to absolute zero. So absolute zero uh, is a special temperature because um, temperature goes up as we add more energy to something. Temperature goes down as we remove energy. So what happens when we've removed all the energy from something, all the heat energy from something? Well, then it's as cold as it can possibly get. If you can't take away any more heat energy, it's as cold as it can possibly get. So absolute zero is actually the coldest temperature possible. Now, when we say absolute zero, though, the zero is related to this Kelvin scale. That's where Kelvin comes in. So zero Kelvin is absolute zero. That's the coldest it can possibly get. Now, if you were to do the conversion on this, so subtract the 273 to find your Celsius, it's a negative 207 degrees Celsius. So that's pretty cold. And if we were to do the conversion into Fahrenheit, that's a negative 459.4 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And then if you go to the deepest parts of space, you'll find that temperatures are just barely above that out in the deepest parts of space. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our lesson.